Sitting on the couch. You've been doing lots and lots and lots and lots of exercises and struggles and still the horse is crooked. So if we see crookedness as the brain's solution, the last thing we want to do is cause a struggle with the horse's brain. We got this. It's gonna be so Is your horse crooked? Have you been told your horse is crooked? Does your horse find it really easy to bend in one direction, but oh, it's like a super tanker on the other side? Maybe someone has told you that one hind leg is weak and you need to get it to step under. How does classical training define the problem? As a sort of tissue pathology or a tissue problem, that literally there's something in that hind leg that is weaker, that's making it more difficult for the horse to step under to take that weight. And some uh, tightness, we do agree that this is how it's expressed. It, it certainly feels like that leg is weak, and you might even see muscle atrophy in one side versus the other, but it doesn't mean that's the cause. The, the nervous system, the movement system, is in that moment, and maybe in most moments of training, saying, that's a really bad idea. I don't have the joint integrity somewhere else to handle that. And therefore, I'm going to stop the body from doing that thing that may cause some other side effect, which again is why we don't really know where the problem lives, because where we see it is usually not what's actually causing it. It's just where it's expressed by the nervous system as a protection. So if we see crookedness as the brain's solution, the last thing we want to do is cause a struggle with the horse's brain. Because if, if it's a protection, which it almost certainly is, then we're just going to cause the brain to go into more of a protection mode. And the more we push against that, the more we're just gonna make the problem worse. Now, it is true that we can certainly cause the nervous system to become more tolerant of those movements it doesn't wanna do. And then it will have to find a different solution. And we might not see the side effects of that for another you know, six weeks, 12 weeks down the road. There's just some problem that to us may feel like it came out of nowhere. Suddenly one day, he's just crooked in a different way or some other problem, or now that stifle seems off or something, right? The pole is stuck in a different way, or now suddenly he's lifting his head to whatever it is. Because we've taken away the brain's best solution, so it's gonna come up with another one. So we don't wanna play compensation whack-a-mole. <laughs> We want to have the movement system solve the problem itself. So how are we going to do that? Well, I think most of you, if you're watching this, you already know how we're going to do that. We're going to set up scenarios where the horse will be more likely to actually actively try to do the things that he's been struggling with but not because we asked him, right? If we want the horse to bend in a certain way, we want him to bend not because he'll earn a treat or he'll earn relief or because that's what we really want him to do. We want him to do that bend with or without us because the nervous system said that's the appropriate obvious way to solve this movement problem. So we're looking for a movement purpose to try to start making those breakthroughs. So we don't see it as a problem that needs to be fixed, a problem that lives in the tissues and we need to correct that. We see it as the brain's solution, but we're not going to ignore it because there is a bigger problem. 
But the bigger problem is not that's a crooked movement or that's a bad movement. It's a perfectly fine movement. The horse is solving the problem. But if the horse is what we would call repeatedly crooked, right, that's a persistent pattern, it means his movement toolbox is too small. <laughs> and he's repeating this over and over again. What we want is to expand the horse's movement toolkit so that, yeah, he's crooked this way, and he's just as capable of being crooked this way. And he'll never be perfectly symmetrical, neither will humans, and doesn't need to be, <laughs> because that's another myth <laughs> that has not, uh, the research has not given us the good, solid, robust data for humans, and especially not for horses, that asymmetry actually is itself a cause of injury. It was so often correlated, but again, correlation is not causation. And now we understand that even horses that are very successful in moving, that have no symptoms of what, what people would think of as pain, right? The horse is not resisting, it's happy, it's showing no signs of stress, it's been deemed clinically sound, but with sophisticated tests, it turns out, those horses are also showing asymmetry. So asymmetry by itself is not a problem. And right now there's no uh, way to quantify it because the studies have not been done that have said, well, we can quantify if you get over this percentage of asymmetry, then you have a problem. But to us, if there is a very extreme asymmetry, there is a problem but the problem is that the movement toolkit is too small, there's not enough variability, now the horse is at risk. So we want to expand the toolkit, but not, definitely not, by trying to correct that crookedness. We want the horse to have enough solutions that now he doesn't have to try to solve every problem with that same uh, movement pattern. And the way we train that is gonna be completely different, not just different from classical training, but in many ways, the opposite. Because we may very well want to train it by sometimes exaggerating the crookedness. So a classical approach is let's avoid the crookedness, let's avoid the crookedness, let's avoid the crookedness, by whatever means, uh, the, depending on the type of training system. We're gonna say, no, we're not gonna try to avoid it but we are going to try to exaggerate it. And more importantly, we're going to try to set up situations and exercises and activities where it's more likely to happen authentically, automatically, naturally. We're gonna say, we want you to have every movement possibility to solve any problem from shoulder in, in the direction you don't normally want to bend and using the inside hind you don't normally, and all of the possibilities all the way to the other crookedness. We want all of them. We want the whole toolkit. It's all there. And then what happens if we do just want that one specific exercise of shoulder in? Well, then we say, okay, we'll put that one on a cue. We'll say, hey horse, you've got this big toolbox. This is wonderful. And I want you to keep the whole toolbox. Every single one of these movements is good and useful. But sometimes I want to reach in and pick up just that tool. Now, here's the big difference. is classical training shrinks the toolbox to a very small number of tools and says, this is the correct tool and the only tool. And it may be, you know, well, they endlessly debate, is it okay to do sometimes a four track <laughs> shoulder in, or is it really supposed to be just the three track and on and on. Uh, and of course, in classical training, some people will say, you must never do a leg yield, leg yield is terrible. Others will say, yeah, leg yield is important, right? We think all of that is nonsense because all the movements matter, right? Horses evolved to do these movements. It never made any sense to actually say that we're gonna restrict the movements of the horse to just the ones we've somehow labeled correct for building the right things. 
because then those exercises don't necessarily transfer that strength that we build up. Remember, training adaptations are specific. If we train three track shoulder in and only three track shoulder in, the horse will get really good at it. We will have trained and adapted the horse to that. He will be strong, he will be supple in that way. In no way means that he will be able to use that strength for a lot of other things or even anything. The only thing we know for certain with training is that we are training the exercise and the exact exercise we're doing. Transfer is a whole other thing. But we can avoid a lot of the problems with transfer completely by training with what is now considered healthy movement, which is training with high variability within a functional range. But functional variability just means all of these variations. They are all possible ways to coordinate and self-organize to solve a movement problem. If you've watched my video on optimizing movement, you'll get a taste of why this is so important. When we do these kinds of exercises, it is really important, as with everything else, that we don't shape the horse in any way, that we don't tell the horse how to do this. We can tell him what to do as a movement purpose, as a task. We can define, here's the environment, and here's the task, here's the thing I want you to do. But the thing has nothing to do with telling the horse how to actually move his body parts. The easiest one, I know I talk about this every time because it is the easiest one, and it's so effective, is you've got the horse on a fence line, you're on the other side of the fence, and even if you don't train with treats, you could do it by holding their food tub, which again, disclaimer, not a good idea for horses that have food anxiety. But we don't assume that most horses are in that situation. And you know your horse, you're the only one that can make that decision. But if you don't train with targets, or uh, which I strongly recommend, but if you don't, you still deliver food to the horse. If you've got a person on one side of the fence with the food, the horse on the other side of the fence line, we play that game called Changed My Mind. <laughs> And you're just going along the fence line with the food and the horse is keeping track of you because you're going to deliver the food in this location. Um, and that fence line could be anything, any barrier. You just don't want the horse crossing over the barrier because this is how we turn it into a straightness exercise. The horse is going to be keeping track of you while going forward. Basically, what does shoulder in solve for the horse? And we're not going to try to figure out, well, it builds these muscles. And we're not talking about that. We're not talking about the mechanics. We're talking about what movement purpose does this solve for the horse? It's an answer to go forward, but keep track of something over there. If the horse is having to move forward for some purpose out there, and there's a reason, a good reason why he wants to keep track of something, the horse is going to solve it in a variety of ways. And some of those ways are going to be shoulder in, shoulder four, three tracks, four tracks, leg yields, all sorts of possibilities. And you want all of them. We want, we want the brain to build such a robust map that it now knows all of these joints are capable of doing all of these things automatically. And then we allow the horse to st start to optimize himself because some movements are going to start out being super awkward for the horse, right? So my young horse, he's not even quite sure yet <laughs> how to cross his legs, right? His adduction and abduction is uh, sometimes, you know, sketchy. He's not fully coordinated on all of these movements, which is so much fun, right? Because my other horses are more experienced. Um, but he's figuring it out. He has a lot of natural asymmetry, as they all do, and he hasn't ever done these kinds of exercises, well, or really anything. He's just, he's at the very, 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 very beginning. We haven't even gotten anywhere near trying to actually set up real exercises for this. We're still just playing. But he's already finding reasons himself, because I'm not training him to do lateral movements. 
He's doing them because he's trying to keep track of the target or me or the food or whatever it is. Um, so later, once certain movements happen, if I want to say, okay, now I really do want this three-track shoulder in, I could put that on a cue. Now, I don't because I don't need those particular movements, and it's very easy for me to vary my position, my body, how I do things. It just takes exploring and experimenting. It's different for every horse to find out. Well, what's more likely to get the horse to, to go, instead of a 45 degree leg yield, what will get the horse to start straightening out a little bit more and end up with something more like a shoulder in? Um, I can just do that by varying my speed, my position, how close I am to the horse, what the horse needs to look at, all that. And I just play with that to get the variety of different movements and I want them all. If I find that the horse is tending to do the same pattern over and over again, like maybe he's only doing leg yield, he's not really doing a shoulder in, and, or, or maybe I want a shoulder four, whatever it is. Well then, again, the problem is not that he's doing a leg yield and he won't do a shoulder in. That's not a problem. The problem is that it's pretty clear that his brain it has a reduced toolkit. It's seeing leg yieldy kind of things as the best answer. As soon as I speed up, the horse would just not be able to do it. So that's why it's pretty easy if I just keep playing with my own position. Uh, so have fun. And so I'm told, dreaming is what keeps you from growing old. Still the same kids sitting on the couch, pretending that I got it all figured out. Like, oh, we got this, it's gonna be so. Yeah. Hey. 